Our second reading for this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9 and 18 through 23. Hear now God's word for you and for all of us today. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet, yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while, and when trouble or persecution arise on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case, a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another Thirty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. O eternal God, we thank you for this witness from Matthew's gospel, which we have just read. And for your Son, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh and the abundant sower. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock, our strength, our hope, our love, and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, again this week, we see a break in our text. Did you notice did it pique your interest? Last week, I told you that it should. But perhaps what we preachers say doesn't always stick for a week, huh? But it should pique your interest. Repetition is good for the memory. Whenever you see that, please wonder, what's going on in between? Well, today we get a wonderful parable from Jesus, and... Interestingly, the second half of our passage after the break, uh, it kind of does my job for me today, right? It, it interprets the parable for us, which is great. But before we get there, what happens in between? What happens in those verses that we skip? You see, this is where the disciples ask Jesus, why are you speaking in parables? Why are you speaking in parables? And really, that's a good question. And the reason the disciples ask him this is because in Matthew's gospel, Jesus is halfway through his ministry before he starts speaking in parables. It's this dramatic shift in his approach. 
It's as if a teacher or a professor suddenly changed their teaching style halfway through the year. That would be rather jarring to us, right? And it was jarring to the disciples. Why are you teaching and speaking in parables? You know, it would have been a lot easier for all of us, the disciples and us here today, for everybody if Jesus were a bit more straightforward in trying to get his point across rather than speaking in parables. You know, for centuries, scholars have poured over these parables to try and understand them more fully. But ultimately, there's really no consensus, any real consensus, on how best to read the parables. Some believe that the parables obscure the truth so that only a select few can truly understand. Others say that parables are subversive. They undermine popular ideas of what is, quote-unquote, the truth. Some scholars are adamant that parables only have one main point, while others say that parables have many different points and purposes, as different as all of us who read them. Well, Origen of Alexandria, he's one of the ones who thinks there's multiple meanings, multiple things we can say about these passages. He was a Christian scholar and theologian all the way back in the third century. And here is a quote from him. He's probably referencing the end of the Gospel of John. Maybe this will sound familiar to you. He wrote this. He said, Not even the whole world itself could contain the books that might be written to fully clarify and develop the parables. Indeed, these simple stories of Jesus are very complex. Their meaning is complex and multi-layered. But fortunately for us, like I mentioned, this parable in particular has an explanation for us right in Scripture. And we see a wonderful depiction of this parable on the cover of our bulletin. It's from the St. John's Bible. I'll hope, I hope after the service you'll come up and take a look. It's stunning in person. But we see in that illumination that the sower is best understood to be Jesus himself. And he sows seeds in four different places, a path, rocky soil amongst thorns, and then finally in the rich, fertile, good soil. And the parable is an allegory. Each environment is supposed to symbolize people's response to Jesus' sowing of the word. Some reject it straight away. This is the seed eaten by the birds. Others receive it joyfully but have shallow roots. They are scorched by the sun. They fall away quite easily. And the third are those whose faith is choked out by thorns, the trappings of material wealth and worldly possessions. And you know, if we are to understand that the seeds, if the seeds were divided evenly between these four places, then a full 75% of the seeds will bear no fruit. That seems rather depressing, doesn't it? 75% bear no fruit. Well, of course, we look to the fourth environment, which provides a sense of hope for us. Famed Preacher and professor Tom Long, he wrote this. Some of the seed Jesus sowed fell on unproductive soil. But the parable contains a surprise. Just at the point when the pattern of defeat seems confirmed, when one disaster after another would lead most sowers to give up farming altogether, a few seeds take root in good soil and burst forth with an unexpectedly abundant harvest. And so it is with the kingdom of God. The work is hard, often disheartening, but the great harvest 
is sure. I love that last line. The great harvest is sure. Well, you know, one of the features of Jesus' parables is they are about ordinary life. Jesus speaks to ordinary people. He speaks in a language that they will understand. He tells stories about sowing seeds because the people to whom he was speaking know about planting and harvesting. But for us more modern-day readers, it makes it a bit more challenging. We don't quite understand the surprising details in the story, the things that would have shocked Jesus' original hearers. And two features in our parable are worth mentioning. The first is the decision to sow seeds in the various places, right? When planting crops, you obviously want to provide the best possible environment for them to grow. Sowing seeds in places that were unlikely to produce would have seemed wasteful, even irresponsible to Jesus' first century listeners. Well, the second surprising detail, it would have been the abundance produced by the good soil, that fourth environment. You see, a typical yield would have been about 10 pounds of grain for every pound of seed sown, a tenfold return. But here, Jesus, he describes a return of 30, 60, even 100-fold Can you imagine? Think of how wide their eyes must have gotten when they hear about a return of 100 pounds of grain for just one pound of seed. It would have sounded miraculous, right? And so even though most of the seeds, 75% of the seeds fail to produce, the ones that do, They provide abundance beyond anything they could have hoped for or imagined. So, what does this parable mean for us this morning? What can we take? How does it speak to us? Well, of course, the low-hanging fruit is that we are to be the rich, fertile soil, right? We are to hear, receive, understand, and follow God's word together. Now, we're all here this morning, here in the sanctuary and online. So I would say, even if you don't feel like fertile ground, where God's kingdom work can bear fruit, you are. I promise you that you are. All of us at least want to be people through whom God works. We are the rich, fertile soil in this story. But this parable also should give us an understanding and awareness of God's abundance. Like the farmers Jesus was speaking to, we have a finite number of resources. We do our best to be responsible stewards of what God has entrusted to us, We work hard to avoid being wasteful, right? But God's grace and God's love knows no bounds. Jesus sowing seeds in environments that are unlikely to produce many results, it's not wasteful or irresponsible. God's gifts of grace, mercy, and love are infinite. God freely offers them to all, even those who are not yet ready to receive it. God's faithfulness is sure, even when our human response is not. And that is good news for us this morning. So while the parable may seem disheartening with only 25% of the seeds bearing fruit, It really is good news for us. And here again, I'll quote Tom Long. He says, It is clear that this is a joyful and encouraging, while at the same time realistic, parable. 
The work of the kingdom, like the work of the farmer, will take its fair share of blows. It will have a series of seemingly overwhelming setbacks, but but the abundant harvest is sure. The abundant harvest is sure. And we know this to be true. We've experienced this in our lives, in our church life. This church, like all churches, has gone through ups and downs, good times and bad. But by remaining faithful and through the grace of God, we've seen good fruit produced. We continue to do wonderful, miraculous work for God's kingdom here in this community and around the world. And our continued support for the Immokalee Fair Housing Alliance is just one of many examples. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we had a guest preacher, Tim Halverson, and I thought he gave a great 4th of July sermon, right? And he asked how hopeful we were for the future of our country, and he used a metaphor about stocks, right? Are we buying? Are we selling? Are we holding? And I thought about this week, but I thought about it in the sense of the church. How hopeful are we about the future of the church? Are we buying? Are we selling? Are we holding? I know many of you are concerned. You're concerned about the future of the church, what the church will look like in 10, 20, 30 years. You know, we've all seen the numbers, the decline, the steady decline across all denominations. I know you've seen it, experienced it in your families as well. Fewer and fewer people, especially those of younger generations, they're just not coming to church, right? It seems now more than ever the seeds of faith are falling in places that will ultimately bear no fruit. So I think this parable offers other good news for us this morning. It's that this isn't the first time that has happened. If in Jesus' own time, only 25% of people are coming to faith, are accepting the word, then I think we're still doing okay today. But as a young person of faith, if I can still count myself as a young person, I think it's relative, right? As a young person who has been called to work in the church, I believe this parable also offers a challenge to us. It asks us to think about the ways the church has been inhospitable to those whose absence we are lamenting. And just to clarify, I'm not talking about this specific church. I'm talking about the church universal, the little c Catholic church, the church in general. So a couple of questions for us this morning. How have we been like the path? Too rigid in our traditions and expectations, which have immediately turned people away. How have we been like the rocky soil, providing shallow, easy answers to life's difficulties, answers that fail to provide depth for their roots to grow? How have we been like the thorns, failing to accept all of the diversity of God's beloved children? which leaves no room for them or their friends and loved ones. These are difficult questions, not just for us, but the whole church, the whole church, ones I hope we'll think about this week, and honestly, ones that this church is grappling with. You know, we're doing a, an initiative called Growing Young, our Christian ed team is engaging in this process where we're being intentional about providing rich, fertile soil for our young people to grow and thrive 
in their faith. And I know many of you are part of that process, and I thank God for you. And now it may seem foolish to many, but I'll tell you that I am actually buying when it comes to the future of the church. I am hopeful. I can't help but be hopeful about the future of the church. And it's not just because of what is going on here with the Growing Young Initiative. It's not just because of the gifted and spirit-filled young pastors I've gotten to know that are serving around the country. Mostly, it's because of our parable that reminds us that God's grace and God's love are so abundant that they are sowed in every place. And that when the seeds do produce, the harvest will be miraculously plentiful. Thanks be to God. Amen.